So how are we, you know, civilians, viewers, victims, like how are we processing all this? Um, and I thought rather than tackle that in sort of an obvious way, um, why not write a book set all over the world um, and simply let it stand for itself? And now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's author. Paul Yoon is currently a Briggs Copeland lecturer at Harvard University and is a recipient of a 5 Under 35 award from the National Book Foundation and a fellowship from the New York Public Library's Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers. His debut story collection, Once the Shore, was selected as a New York Times notable book and a best debut of the year by National Public Radio. His novel, Snow Hunters, won the 2014 Young Lions Fiction Award. The six stories in his latest collection, The Mountain, travel across decades and across the globe to connect characters who struggle to make peace with their lives after the chaotic pasts have left them stranded. The Boston Globe calls the book a haunting world tour of the loss and alienation that war and its aftermath have brought us all over the last century. This is a genuine work of art, a shadow land of survivors that is tough and elegant and true and beautiful. We are very pleased to have Paul Yoon here with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming him to Harvard Bookstore. So to give some background here, I'm just gonna talk for a few minutes to give some background about this book and then I'll do a short reading. Um, I was thinking about how much access we have to the world. And you know, let me just say, this isn't a unique thought at all, right? Um, it's just something I've been thinking about. And by access, I mean, we have this ability to learn about an event across the world instantaneously, right? Um, for example, today, um, say via Twitter or news feeds, and this could be something as huge as a terrorist attack, right, in Europe, or something as mundane as what someone ate uh, in South America, right, for dinner and decide to take a beautiful photo of. Um, but with that access, what's been the most disturbing and fascinating to me is how easily we um, have access to news of violence. Um, and how easily and quickly we can be affected by that, whether that's, again, um, an act of terrorism or even violence, say, within something smaller, you know, like the violence within a house, um, or something even more intimate, like a body. Um, so how are we, you know, civilians, viewers, victims, like, how are we processing all this? Um, and I thought, rather than tackle that in sort of an obvious way, um, why not write a book set all over the world um, and simply let it stand for itself? Um, so all this became a kind of backdrop to this project, which turned into a collection of short and long stories um, that are set all over the world, um, as Nell said, and uh, jumps around in time, too. So we start in the Hudson Valley of New York, um, which is where I'm from. And then we move east across the world, uh, simultaneously we're also moving forward in time. Uh, so the book begins in the early 20th century and then crosses over into a kind of near future as we move east. Um, and then it kind of comes full circle back to the Hudson Valley. Um, and I think this was my attempt at producing a kind of global canvas um, and a book that I hope feels sort of vast, right? And an attempt at capturing something that feels very fleeting to me, which is um, this kind of constant river of information and history and thought and news and tragedy that affects our lives at every moment. Um, so tonight I'm going to read from the title story of the collection, which is called The Mountain. And we're in East Asia, beginning in South Korea um, and then moving towards Shanghai. And this is set in a kind of future time. So by now in the book, we've already experienced early 20th century Second World War, and early 21st century. Um, and the reason I share that is simply, I, I want you to sort of pretend that you've experienced that too um, when you're sort of experiencing uh, this reading. Um, and I'll just start from the beginning and read for about 15 minutes. Um, and then I thought we could open it up to anything you want to talk about. Here are the opening pages of the mountain. <coughs> She had been at the stop since before the morning. She was often there sitting on the bench, avoiding the rain. If she had enough coins, she bought tea from the vending machine. If she didn't, she waited to see if someone would give her some coins. She had nowhere to go. 
She stayed until someone noticed or until it got too dark, or when on a rare summer night it got too cold. Even then, she stayed a little longer, leaning into the hum of the vending machine, the brief air of a bus's open door. One day, a young man approached her about a job. He had been watching as all the buses picked up and dropped off passengers while she stayed, the tips of her shoes drenched by the spray of the tires. In her years in South Korea, she had never been approached about anything except by men who asked her if she was lonely and wanted company. She felt the small knuckle of the pocket knife in her boot as he approached. She started to lean down but changed her mind. He waved a piece of paper at her in a way that reminded her of a long ago friend whose face she could no longer recall. Only that gesture, a wave before they went swimming. He was wearing sunglasses even though there was no sun that day. He was young and handsome and smelled like an expensive fragrance. He also had on the sneakers she saw on the television at an electronic store downtown. A music video with dancers, a good song. She tapped her foot to the remembered beat as he stood at a respectful distance and opened the paper, which was a pamphlet, and showed her photos of an apartment complex, a great river, parks. Then he spoke in Mandarin, which surprised her. She spoke in Mandarin back to him. She said she liked his sunglasses. He laughed and bought her tea. He sat down. A puddle began to form on the uneven road, catching a portion of the sky. He said it was OK if she no longer had her documents. He said they would take care of her. On the back of the pamphlet was the name of a ferry boat and a pier number in the harbor. Below that was written a time and day. She looked away to cough and wiped her mouth, swallowing some phlegm she would spit out if he weren't here. Come back home, he said. He didn't wait for her to answer. A bus pulled up and she watched him get on, still stunned by what he said, still confused. She wondered if he meant the city. She looked down at the pamphlet, searching the photos, not yet recognizing the river. Then she did. And even though she knew the stranger was gone, she leaned forward to follow the route of the bus as it made its way down the hill. She wondered if they had met in an old life. He wasn't the friend she used to swim with, she knew that. But she wondered all the same if this man knew her in some way, had known all of them who used to swim there, waiting for their fathers. Where were all of them now? It felt as though she hadn't thought of them in years. She tried again to place the man she had just met, tried again to place him in that river. It was only after the bus vanished from her view that she noticed the sunglasses. They lay on the bench beside her. They were like the ones from the movie about the American Navy. She left them alone, counting the raindrops falling against the plastic shelter above her. She watched the surface of the puddle as it kept breaking. She coughed again and spat out her phlegm. The advertisement screen switched from an energy drink to the new camera she had begun to see on the streets and the boardwalks. Anyone who could afford it was buying one. She finished her tea and then put the sunglasses on. There was a nice weight to them. Her name was Faye. She was 26. She had been in South Korea for over 10 years. She was in the port city of Incheon, and she could see the harbor from the stop. In the puddle, two birds moved from one level of sky to another. She thought she would see the man again, but she didn't. She took the ferry boat with six others and entered the sea. She thought they would leave in the dark or that they would be hidden somewhere far below the deck the way she had come years ago, but neither happened. They left in the bright of day, the captain and the four crew members wearing shirts that advertised a tour group, Sunshine Tours, and one even had a loudspeaker and began to talk about Incheon during the war. There were more women than men on board. Most of them spoke Mandarin, though there was a Korean man and a Russian. Some were bored by the slow trip. Others were eager or anxious. There were two women who whispered off into each other. They were frightened as the coastline vanished and the hours passed. Frightened because it might not be a factory they would be working at, or an apartment building they would be living in. That they had been tricked like so many others. It must have occurred to them before they had agreed to come. And yet they had come to the dock just like Faye. It had of course occurred to her that all of this was something else. But she still boarded. She boarded after studying the photos. She had slipped her father's pocket knife into her underwear as she walked across the gangplank, but they didn't check her body or even her bag.
On the ferry boat, the closest anyone ever got to her was when they passed out water bottles or helped them hours later as they switched vessels far at sea. On the new boat, as the day ended, they listened to a crew member repeat a few Mandarin phases for the ones who didn't speak the language. All the passengers took turns saying them, even Fei, who hadn't spoken certain phrases in a long time. She felt her tongue loosen, a familiar turn of her mouth and her voice, a slipping into years she had stopped thinking of. They were given a dinner of gel packets. The gel came in a foil, pack the size of a playing card you tore at the corner and sucked on. The shelters carried them, and so did the vending machine at the bus stop. She chose the shrimp-flavored one. Her father would have liked the sweet potato. She kept the sunglasses on. She thought of the young man and his friendliness and wondered if it was sincere or whether talking to people like her was something he did. She knew it was the latter, but wondered all the same. It was a larger boat, and to keep active, they were encouraged to pace the deck. She walked back and forth as the sun was setting. She never saw the ocean that first time, leaving hidden below the deck. Now she was embraced by a vastness she hadn't imagined. It covered her. It left her breathless and distracted. The crew members appeared. They gathered at the center of the deck in a circle and huddled together. With their bodies leaning toward each other, they resembled a tree or a close flower. She recalled the strange tree from when she was younger, bone white and disfigured, how they had found her father collapsed there. Where had that been? Where was that tree? A field, the low sun on him, that river. The crew members were still huddled together. Then they all leaned back suddenly and looked up. She saw an arm lift, a palm open, and a metallic ball flew above their heads and hovered for a moment before it shot up into the air. It flew in silence, or if there was a noise, she couldn't hear it. Only this thing the size of a child's fist shooting straight up into the sky and vanishing. It returned a few minutes later. It drifted down, touched the hand that sent it up. She could now see the bracelet the man was wearing, and the ball landed on that. She heard a click and a whirring. Everyone on deck gathered as the man tapped on the bracelet, and from the ball, a video of the sea projected into the air. The image was colorful and textured, their boat the size of a thumbnail, the fading wake. It could have, been, it could have gone higher, she heard one of the crew members say. It's still cool, someone else said. Faye walked closer. As the video zoomed in on the boat, she recognized her own shape on the deck. The top of her head, her arms and her hands, the other passengers as well, all from above and scattered. Then the video tilted and caught the sun moving down past the horizon. Faye looked out across the ocean, the sun now gone, only the remaining light. She asked the men where in the ocean they were, but they couldn't tell her that. They seemed disappointed in her in some way she didn't understand. They turned the camera off and dispersed. The passengers continued on their walks around the deck, the Russian practice, Mandarin. It was summer, Faye returned to the railing. She caught the first stars, the sudden moon. She had only wanted to remember and come back. In the morning, they entered a quiet bay. She could see fishing huts behind a copse and rafts on the sand. The smell of a grill made her mouth water. They disembarked onto a small road motorboat, three at a time, and climbed the beach toward a van that was waiting for them. The driver said something she couldn't hear and pulled open the side door. Faye was the last to get in. As she watched the boat turn and motor away, she was struck by a sudden hollowing, as though her chest was caving in, as though there was a core part of her that was still far at sea. Why had she come back? She was no longer sure. A dull pain rose from her side. She rubbed the space and coughed, swallowing the phlegm. She looked around at the beach and the huts. Two children wearing shirts but no pants were looking back. She heard the flap of their sandals as they jumped on a log and regained their balance. She felt a hand on her arm. One of the women from the boat was reaching down. The woman didn't appear to be frightened anymore. She was a little older than Faye and said, come on, and Faye climbed into the van. They drove for many hours. They drove without stopping. If one of them had to use the bathroom, the others turned and pretended to ignore the sound of piss hitting the bucket. The only windows in the back of the van were on the rear doors, so whatever face saw the road and the landscape was at it as it was pulling away. 
They were heading south into Shanghai. It was where she was born, where her father had been born and where they had once lived, the two of them, first in the city and then farther out, closer to the chemical plant, Faye always at home and her father at work. Faye's mother left them a long time ago. The driver turned on the radio and they listened to pop songs. Some of them were K-pop and the Korean man sang along holding an imaginary microphone. He claimed to be a karaoke champion, which made some of them laugh even though they couldn't deny his voice was beautiful, deep and lulling like the water on some days. She would never know his name, but she would always remember him, even much later, when her life and her days were so far from how she ever imagined them. For his singing that calmed her while she gazed out the window, where there was the country that used to be her home, receding, where there was nothing familiar on that first day, not even the trees and the different colored fields, the horses and the river, road signs and businesses, fluorescent lights still on in the daytime. And I'll stop there. That's the first chapter. Any questions? Emily, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, everything. I mean, it's the most daunting thing to write anything, right? It's kind of an act of courage and audacity um, and faith, a leap of faith. Um, I think for this particular book, I was the most intimidating thing and therefore the most challenging was um, I literally set out to write uh, a book set around the world, right? So, so I, had, I, had a, I had a world map pinned to the wall in the office that that had been given to me to write this book. And, um, and, um, and the first thing was, well, how do I do that? Where do I start, right? Um, where, where do I set these stories? And how many stories am I gonna you know, put into a book like this? Um, and so a lot of it was kind of toying with places and things like that. And then ultimately I started, I decided on the Hudson Valley because you know, that's where I'm from in the New York. Um, so there was a kind of emotional autobiographical anchor there. Um, and, then, and then my eyes kind of just sort of headed east. Um, and I was sort of looking for places where I had either direct or, in connect, or indirect connections to. Um, and I found myself kind of you know, thinking of Spain, thinking of France, and then thinking of East Asia. Um, and that became kind of like the structure of the book, you know, where I was, just, I was, I was, I was gonna head east. And I was just gonna take it one sort of story at a time. But, I mean, without question, each kind of, you know, passport stamp, you know, now you're in Spain, you know, it was just, it was really horrifying and scary, you know, um, to kind of have the courage to write a play about a place that you didn't really know a whole lot about, enter that place, right, and just have the faith that the story would kind of guide, would guide. So did you have all the pins on the map before you created the characters? Because the characters are very internal and you store them. Yeah. No, I didn't really have any. I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, uh, I, I wrote. Um, th this is a rare time where I think if you hear sort of novelists talk and write, and the kind of novel um, or even story collections, it's never sort of chronological in the way it's presented in the book, right? It's like, oh, like Ondaatje wrote the middle of Divisadero before he began the first, right? Or someone wrote the middle, the, the last story in a collection, you know, it just ended up moving that, right? This is, this is a rare case where um, this is chronological in my writing of it. This, so all the stories are arranged in the way I wrote it. Um, and so Willow and the Moon, which is the first story set in the early 20th century um, and deals with a sanatorium in upstate New York, that was the first story. Um, and when I wrote it, I actually just didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have a kind of, um, you know, map of anything in place. I wasn't really sure, you know. Um, and so that became the kind of, that was the epicenter, you know. So um, I was sort of using that story as a kind of lighthouse to guide me. So all the, all the themes and all the kind of characters like the character situations and all that, it's all in that story. Um, and so I kept on looking to that story to kind of guide me to spread out, you know, and, ex and explode the kind of book from there. Yeah. 
Yeah. How long did it take you to write it, and how many times did you rewrite each of the um, I wrote this draft very, very quickly. It's the fastest book I've ever written. Um, I've been, I was thinking about it for years, um, but I was given an opportunity. Um, I received a fellowship from the New York Public Library um, two years ago, and um, when I was, I was coming at it from, you know, consistently sort of juggling day jobs and trying to find time to write. And so when I was given this opportunity to um, write full time which is kind of this amazing gift. But I knew it was a limited amount of time, it was only a year, um, or not even that, I think it was only nine months, um, like an academic calendar, right? Um, I, made, I made two promises. I said I was gonna write as fast as possible, and I was gonna write, um, and every day I was gonna have a lot of fun um, doing it. Um, and so um, it, was, it was this kind of opportunity that I did not let go to waste. Um, and I knew how fortunate that was, so um, I, I wrote every day, and, and, and so I wrote the, the original draft very quickly. I wrote it in nine months, um, which is uh, something I've never done before. Um, and then editing took a bit longer there. And before that, all that thinking about it took a lot longer. That took years. Um, and sort of, you know, you have these ideas, and you have these thoughts, and you have these scenes and sentences, but you're not really sure. Like, they're not anchored anywhere. They're kind of, you know, floating. And so, so the trick is to trust that eventually they'll sort of land somewhere eventually and find shape. Um, so I, I can see how it would be sort of um, uh, courageous to write about places that you don't have sort of intimate familiarity with. But does it make it easier or harder if you're writing about those places in different period, time periods? You mean like sort of both it's a foreign place but also a different time period? Yeah. Does it let you off the hook or does it, does it make it harder to get the that's a really great question. I think it, I don't know if it lets me off the hook, but I do sort of trick myself into believing on first draft that I have a lot more sort of creative freedom because it's, it's a distant sort of temporal location, right? So, um, like for example, the second story in this, which is the longest, is set um, a few years after the Second World War um, in Calais, France. And so, you know, uh, I, I have no experience, you know, in the late 40s um, in France. So um, it, it was terrifying. Again, it was terrifying, right, um, to kind of enter that space. But it was also, well, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to be very forgiving and very easy on myself on first draft and kind of let everything just go. And maybe if I think about something really hard enough, as long as it's focused on character, maybe there will be a kind of universal moment in these, in these scenes that actually can relate to post-World War sort of Reconstruction era of France. And just kind of having that blind faith and trust. And then once you get that draft done, you know, you're just so happy you actually finished a draft of something. But then, but then you can go back and the, you know, the great joy is editing and researching and all that, just to make sure that you haven't done anything, you know, completely disrespectful of, of that time, right, and that location. Yeah. Yeah, Stacey. Did the, did the turmoil of any of your characters weigh on you during the process, or did you really manage to have a, a fun time writing the book? I had a fun time pretending to be a full-time writer for a year, where they, were, they, had, they gave me an office and I felt really fancy about it. Um, no, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was, there was great turmoil. Um, I remember, again, like just to return to Still a Fire, which is the second story and the longest story um, about poor World War fans. There's a lot of um, kind of violence in it, um, unexpected violence in it for me. And I, I would have, um, um, I would have like these horrific dreams um, that were extremely violent to my own body um, because there's a lot of bodily violence in that story. And so, um, so um, to go into a dark place like that was, 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 was incredibly difficult. Um, um, and so it was extra important for me to, I know I'm making this sound like you really want to run and get this book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was incredibly important. Um, to counterbalance that, right? So, so, so if I was going to have kind of extreme kind of, you know, dire circumstances, I'm also going to, when you find that moment of joy or hope in a scene or a story, right? It's so magical and special, right? It just makes you want to weep, right? From like dealing with, 
all that. So that was that was also like a joyful part too. Was like I went to a dark place, but then I managed to like bring the characters out of it, no matter how brief that is. And that was super important um, for me and just sort of you know my mental health. But just also just I, I'm an optimist at heart, right? So I had to believe that. Like that is true, right? That no matter how dark it gets, there's gonna be like moments of joy, right? Anyone else? Hello, that's my wife. <laughs> It's a hard question. I feel like she's throwing me that question on purpose. Um, I'm trying to think. Sorry. No, no, it's a good question. I mean, I think the problem with that is that I, I just I read so much, you know, and I don't, I don't. It's it's hard for me to kind of equate like time periods of books. But um, there's one particular book by um, uh, Jonathan Ledgard, J. M. Ledgard, called Submergence. Um, it's, it's, it's uh, published by a small uh, press called Coffee House Press, um, and it deals with, um, um, it's this amazing novel that's kind of this two narratives, where one narrative deals with someone, um, a British spy who's being um, tortured and interrogated by um, the Taliban in North Africa. So there's that one thread, but then there's also this amazing secondary thread where it deals with an uh, oceanographer, or a scientist who's attempting the deepest dive into the ocean um, while that's going on. So you have these two simultaneous actions happening, and the only reason why they're connected is because they are lovers. They were lovers. Um, and so that, I think that book was really important for me because it's set in these two vast locations. And there isn't a kind of obvious connection other than that they had like a tryst one Christmas at a hotel, right? And so they're not in touch or anything like that. Um, and so I think thinking about sort of books that may not necessarily have a kind of obvious connection from characters to places was important. I think Submergence did that really well for me, um, only because I was sort of attempting to do that with this book. Yeah. I was just wanting to ask you what it was like for you to write in a woman's voice and then through that kind of Yeah, for sure. Um, I think I was, so, I was so terrified by this book in terms of, you know, I was just dealing with locations that I didn't know about, time periods I didn't know about, people I didn't know about. It was all so daunting that I think there wasn't one thing that was more daunting. It was all very daunting. Um, I'm, I can just honestly say that because of that, I actually really didn't think about how daunting it was to be in the perspective of a woman when I was writing it because it just happened that it kind of came out that way. Um, and I just had to sort of trust that, that for some reason it was, my vision for this story was that the protagonist was gonna be a woman. And so I just had to trust that. Um, and that's, and again, it was this kind of blind faith yeah. Blindfolded. Completely blindfolded. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. <laughs> Just kind of stumbling along. <laughs> yeah, Sarah. Um, you, you talked a little bit at the beginning about the immediacy of information available to us, especially about mm -hmm. violence mm -hmm. news. and how do you, I don't know if you have an answer to this, but how do you keep yourself connected to what's going on immediately? in the immediate sense and current events, but also keep yourself in the world of whatever you're writing. Like, how do you balance kind of your presence in both of those worlds? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does make sense. Um, I think it's a really great question. I think, I don't know if this is gonna be an answer, but I think one kind of fuels the other. Um, I think, I think whatever is happening on the news or outside the news, you know, day to day is, is what's forming me, right? It's what's shaping me and that's whatever, that's what I'm bringing um, to that day when I'm writing, right? I mean, I, it doesn't matter how sort of disparate or foreign the, the story is to what's going on. Um, I can't help but bring, you know, 
whatever I'm feeling, what mood I'm in, you know, horrific events I've just read about or seen on television, right? Um, I can't ha help, and I'm not saying this, this is true for all writers, I'm just saying this is just for me, I can't help but kind of carry that over to translate that onto the page in some way. Um, I'm doing it with it whether I know it or not. You know, um, it's just there in some way. Um, so I think it's actually like it's just it's actually just linked. Um, um, did that answer your question? So yeah, okay, okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Hey. Um, you said some of the stories were set in your future. Yeah, just this one I just read. Yeah, okay. yeah, just that. I'm wondering when you decided to push into the. Future yeah, for sure. And what it allowed you? allowed me sleepless nights of pure <laughs> dread and because it's it's just so outside my comfort zone um i had no intention of doing it um i this i just distinctly remember the moment i actually read it out loud um i didn't know ex i i actually just firmly thought this book this or this story that i just read um the first chapter was going to be set um in sort of in contemporary time um but then i ended up you know she i brought her onto the boat and and I wrote the scene where she's watching these crew members um, gather together, and um, they're sort of huddled, you know, like a tree or a flower. Um, and then they kind of like look up. Um, and I knew they were holding something, right? Something was kind of attached to them. Um, but again, like this was just for, completely in the realm of just the now. Um, and yet I had this tremendous desire probably because I had been working on this book so intensely for so long to kind of just like let go, right? Um, and could just kind of like just do something. And, um, and I realized that I had this tremendous, tremendous desire to release whatever it was they were holding. <laughs> and um, it was as simple as that. I just needed a kind of like scream, <laughs> like let something go, you know? And so I wrote this scene where this ball flies up into the air. Um, and as soon as I wrote that, I knew I had entered like totally uncharted territory for me, um, which was scary. But I mean, with fear, I think comes like great excitement, right? When you're writing, um, and then I think it became the tricky part was I didn't want it to make it kind of outlandish and sort of so severe and like enter I don't know like Blade Runner territory or something like that because I think it just wouldn't it wouldn't go well with the book it would be that story would be an outlier right and I was I really really wanted a book that felt like more than the sum of its parts that that felt like a canvas you know um, and I didn't want this one futuristic story to be this kind of thing that was sticking out so then it was a the trick of trying to figure out a way to create a speculative futuristic world but have people sort of, or not people, but just sort of have the possibility that it could be tomorrow, right? Um, and so something like really, really small, like a personal drone camera, seemed completely like viable and convincing to me, to me. Um, I mean, we're sort of nearly there anyway, right? I'm running on the Charles and I'm like almost getting hit by kids flying their drones all the time. But they're just, they're huge, right? So maybe tomorrow they'll just be smaller, you know? And so, I mean, other than that and the weird food they eat, like the gel packets, um, there's nothing else that's kind of outlandish or futuristic about that story, right? And so it was really important for me to actually not focus on that stuff, but focus more on the other details, yeah. Um, were there any moments or stories from your history that you kind of channeled as you wrote, or that you found yourself thinking about as you wrote? I missed that first part. I'm sorry. Say um, again. Yeah. You know, moments or stories from your own life. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Sure. About as you wrote. For sure. Um, the last story, um, Milner Field. It's called, um, and and it is probably the most emotionally autobiographical story in the, in the book. Um, and a lot of that just simply has to do with I was writing about my dad. Um, who's, who's a retired physician, so, um, who recently retired. So, um, so when, I, when, I, when I set off to write that, the opening first few pages, um, it's, just, it's just my dad, you know? I'm just writing about my dad. Um, and so, and just kind of growing up in the Hudson Valley um, and being kind of a children of, of an immigrant, you know? And so, um, so yeah, for sure, that was, that's like the first story that comes to mind. But 
no question there are sort of small moments like that of emotional autobiography, you know, autobiography. No, there's nothing in this book that actually like happened to me per se, you know, that I'm, I'm relating verbatim, but there's certainly um, like sort of certain memories that have kind of translated into sort of different eras, you know, and scenes and time periods, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious how, just generally speaking about your work, not only this, this, this book, but what would you be thrilled, what kind of response from a reader would utterly thrill you? <laughs> that you read my work? Have you read my work? <laughs> that would thrill me. That would absolutely thrill me. Um, I don't know, I think that's a really hard question because I think the reading experience is actually quite private and personal and intimate. Um, my relationship with, you know, the books that I adore and love, I mean, I would take a bullet for the books that I love. Um, and, and that's something that I can't really put into words. Um, it's just this kind of intense, kind of bright core um, feeling that I have. So if someone is experiencing something extremely emotional or, or something that they can't be put into words when they read my work, I mean, that's that's a beautiful thing, and I'd be really honored and humbled by that. So that's, that's, that's the best I can give you. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everyone.